fighting though. That's the problem when you Bingo, come out faster. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it's something to where I feel, in a sense, they've been working on it for so many years. They probably have so many ideas and so many stories that they're like, now let's go in this direction. Let's tune it up some, but now we can kind of go in this direction with it because we kind of opened this world up more, Like especially with this last one, mm-hmm. with Evil Dead Rise. So it'll be really interesting to see what they do with it. And I hope they do crank them out, but I do agree, James. Even though I do feel like they have some ideas and stuff together, I hope it's not rushed. But I hope it's faster than every, because the last one came out 2013. So let's say hopefully quicker than every 10 years. Maybe even. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Even if you cut that in half, wouldn't be bad. Of course, we'd want them even sooner than that, but you cut them in half, I mean, shit. Well, I, you know, what I would love to see with the contemporary Evil Dead films is maybe about four more films and then um, actually bring the Deadites far enough in that it's actually like a plague. And the world against the deadites and that opens up for a whole other realm of evil dead that, um, oh man. That, I, I think saying, that might be a, what Ramey eventually wanted to do uh like everybody's like you know okay well what what's what's the best possible thing well what if it got out what if you know ash didn't save the day at some point hmm. somebody's not going to save the day and as we saw in evil dead rise Deadites can jump from people to people and then they can go in a nice little cabin wherever the fuck they are. And, you know, so, you know, it lends well to... Because Deadites fall in that weird area of supernatural and zombie. Yeah. We have a lot of fun with that. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. Now, with that idea, though, Trevor, do you think it would work better as a series? Mm. Maybe, big, maybe the big, the big whatever is the movie. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think you know a movie in that direction because of the spectacle of it okay. uh, would make sense. But you know, continuing as a television show, it, at some point, you know, it's the big thing is: are people going to keep the Evil Dead scripts? fresh and not cut corners that it just becomes corny um and so far uh Raimi has been really really good about you know making sure that you know he picks directors um and you know he doesn't always get his wish but he at least gets basically, you know, final on that. Yeah, I, I, you know, we trust this director. Um, so we'll see. Well, yeah, yeah, maybe we'll just see what they do next with that. I mean, it but, seems like every horror, you know, franchise uh, has to have some down period of really bad stuff, and then revive. But we'll see. Yeah, but I mean, honestly. Evil Dead really didn't have anything really bad, in my opinion. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I, I mean, don't, like, I'm not as I don't hate it. I don't care for it as much as a lot of people do. But uh, Army of Darkness, mm-hmm. I'm not a big fan of it. It's okay. I love Army of Darkness. I love I it too. You know, you know, it was a lot more entertaining when I was a teenager. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, to rewatch it now the the comedy influences are so obvious that you just kind of go oh but it's still fun it's and no I, it's it's fun i'm just not crazy about that one like yeah, part two is if you want to go to the original part two is my favorite well fun. part two is the one to start with yes um evil dead one is is a jewel but um it, it's it's it is arguably more gross than the second one um, besides that, the second one has everything else going for it. Agreed. But again, 2013 is my favorite out of the whole thing. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I would go with that one, then part two, I think. Now I'm not sure after that. Mm. I'm not sure after that. Maybe part one, then rise, and then the last, you know, the other one. Mm. Okay. Cool. 
But people, that's not why we're here. Mm. <laughs> we're here to discuss this movie right here. Matinee with the man, the myth, the legend. I forgot his name. John Goodman. Oh, John Goodman. <laughs> I forgot his name for like two seconds. Real play. <laughs> I was like, I don't think he's John. What's his last name? I know it's not Candy. It's the other one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Don you're, on a fl- you're on a flow, too. You're going until you're like the legend. You're like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, and there was, there was no point leaving the screen up and just leaving like a blank. Oh, I'm just going to be honest with you guys, man. Sturdy, you know, sometimes I slip up. We forget. Uh, that's no point. Funny. This is live. Like if it was pre-recorded, I could re-record that shit. Like, all right, here's the intro. I know the guy's name now. Nah, this is live. Boom, forgot his name. Sorry, but yeah, John Goodman, shout out to you. Which he was in some shit. He was in the Flintstones, guys. The fucking Flintstones. Yeah. Flintstones movie. Yeah. yeah, live action. And Roseanne. I, I'm not talking about the Connors. I'm talking about Roseanne when it was. Oh, oh man. back in the day. I love that show. I didn't watch the newer shit, even without all the controversy and all that. I just, I don't really care for certain movies that I give a different respect for, but shows that like rebooted and remade, it just feels different. It just feels mm. way too different. And I'm just like, that's it. You're used to them as kids and they're all adults now. You're like, nah. Yeah. Cause I can still yeah. go back. To, Cause I, you know what it is too? Like, I can still go back to it and watch like the older shows and. The adult jokes, well, one for right now, I understand it. So I'm like, oh, shit. So this is what my parents are laughing. You nasty motherfuckers. <laughs> but you know what I mean? For all that shit, and then you still laugh at the childhood shit you would laugh at because you still remember those little kitty jokes you would laugh at. And it just, it doesn't hit the same when they remake the shows like it does for a movie. Some movies, they can do good and they're cool. Some movies, it's like, eh, whatever. But I feel like shows... I feel like it's more missed than hit. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I, but I think television shows have more of a direct nostalgia with people that, you know, nowadays the, the adage is parents are letting their kids grow up on their iPads. When I oh. was a kid, it was the other way. It was you're letting the television raise your kids. Well, out of necessity times you did. And I think several generations that still were focused on TV being the main device in the house, mm-hmm. uh, those television shows have much more nostalgia for us. They directly yeah. connect to our childhood. So when you try to reboot it, or even better, reboot it with like a 10-year span of age where the mm-hmm. middle is missing, um, it just doesn't have the same, you know, it, it's like those people who, you know, have to, to go out and collect VHSs and they still have functioning square televisions or have, you know, worked out that they can run, you know, mm-hmm. uh, VHS is they're so obsessed with nostalgia, but that's a very small part of the, 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 yeah. the populace television though. It, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And it, it's funny because it's like the after school specials and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. TGI, I mean, TGIF, mm-hmm. all those shows, like, it would feel good. It was awesome to get home from school or whatever the case may be, or mm-hmm. four or five o'clock, you know, you do your homework, you do what you got to do, and it's like, boom, I'm watching this, I'm watching that. Saturday, mm-hmm. I'm watching this, I'm watching that. And, yeah, when it's remade, it's just like, um, I'll try it out. Like, I want to watch the, that 90s show, but I'm scared. I'm just like... I, I watched the first season. It's pretty, yeah. I watched the first yeah. season. There's some funny parts, but it's more. Uh, it, it, it leans towards more like Disney. Uh, it's like like Full House type. It's like it took all the fun raunchiness away, didn't it? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> and, and and that's what I, and that's what I'm saying right there. Like if you're gonna remake the show and redo the show, mm-hmm. keep the good shit in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if. If you guys think it's gonna be problematic, they slip a little stuff in, like Red's in it. The the you know the father. 
Yeah, I, I, I know, but still. He still it, does it, his shit, like dumbass and all that stuff. But It needs to be the same. I mean, the 90s weren't soft. <laughs> yeah. The 90s yeah. weren't 2024. But, yeah, I watched it just to give it a shot. And I was like, okay, it's a little bit better than I thought, but it's not, like, great. God, the Monster Squad is one of the most problematic films ever made. <laughs> but still, everybody loves it. Yeah. So, you know, it's. But it's a beautiful example of where culture was circa 1990s and late yeah. 1980s. Compared to where so, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of nostalgia, uh, what you the movie that you guys watched and invited me on here has a lot to do with nostalgia. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Which, yeah. I want to say this. I want to talk about the movie experience. And mm-hmm. I this movie is actually a perfect example of it. I wish that for, maybe not for every single movie, but for specific movies, let's just use the horror genre. Well, sure, you can use any genre, I guess, but you got, like, what you got from this movie, as far as what, as far as what it set out to be with, you know, with the action going on and the, the, the mm-hmm. stuff going on, the guy dressed up as the ant and the thing, and the little, the little fun stuff going on during the film. I think that would be such a fun experience. But, again, you have, you have it to where you say, so you're in a theater, you know, theater 14 is what does that. So you want to like that experience, you go to theater 14. Theater 10 does not do that. So it'll be over mm-hmm. here, it'll be, right, it'll be normal, it'll be quiet. But I think that would be a fun experience to where it's like, even if you're going to pay an extra $2, so what? It'd be fun to do. I would do it. I'd watch the movie regular first. And like, all right, I got to see this with the experience because this is going to be fun as fuck. Well, you Depending know, the thing that's, that's really hilarious is now, of course, um, Wosley, who is the filmmaker played by John Goodman, um, it's way over the top, and it's more than you know any schlockmeister showman ever did. But this kind of stuff was very common in the 1950s and toward the beginning of the 1960s. Um, there's this wonderful film, uh, it's called The Tingler by William. <laughs> That's all and, summer. Well, it came out roughly around 1959. Uh, William Castle is actually the man who Wosley is most modeled after. Because his thing was, how do you make the movie experience even better? And with him, take the example The Tingler. The Tingler, which was a Vincent Price uh, vehicle, uh, was about this weird thing that would attach itself to your spine Mm. and and it could eventually kill you and the schlock level that castle did was okay um seats in theaters randomly were actually wired for individual scenes that when the tingler attached the seats would shock that's cool so this 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 is like you know what was really going on uh with um a lot of the what we like to consider b horror movies nowadays or b monster movies Mm -hmm. uh with castle um one of the big ones was you know you'd be given a certificate by lloyd's of london that if you die while you're watching this film, we will give so much money to your family. Um, uh, Kathy Moriarty's character, who is the the woman connected to Mr. Wosley, is a nurse outside the theater in what was done by many, many filmmakers, especially by Castle, and that is having a nurse on standby or doctor on standby. Um, these various kind of scopes and things like that. William Castle was doing it uh, for years and he was the best at it. But Wosley, on top of William Castle, also is very much, and we'll, we'll talk later about it, is very much like a Roger Corman. And he's also very much like uh, Samuel Arkoff, who was a director and a producer, but owner of American International Pictures, and he was a distributor. So 
the gentleman that Woesley wants to, you know, impress, uh, Mr. Spector, is basically like Samuel Z. Arkoff at the time. And so this is all like movies like this happened. <laughs> okay. They weren't as, you know, like crazy, uh, but yeah, they were doing those kind of uh, schlocky stunts. That'd be a cool uh, experience, uh, though. That's a, that's what I'm saying, though. Like, if I ever get a theater, that's one thing that will be happening. There will be maybe two or three screens. That's it. But one screen, <laughs> one screen only. It's going to be like that. The other two are going to be normal. Mm -hmm. Actually, here's how it'd be. I don't even care if I'm throwing this idea out there. One screen would be like that. One screen would be just black and white with whatever movie I can get on there. And one screen would be mm -hmm. the normal in color. Boom. That's three different experiences. Fun. Is there some theaters have the rumble seating? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, rumble Actually seating. Was, was That's like the farthest they go this uh, these days. It's like rumble yeah. seating. They won't like shock you or anything. They're like, hey, we'll just look. Well, we'll I mean, you don't want to like you don't want you don't want to have something that may harm somebody, but I would say with the rumble seating, you could do more, maybe have it more like of a vibration shake, kind of move around, not too much. Of course, you have the warning and all that shit. Mm. But uh yeah. Because you really want, I feel like there's times where you really want that, it's like a horror movie, you really want that experience. You want something to just jump up and try not to swing, though. That's the thing. If you swing, if you hit, <laughs> you get kicked out. Yo, I'm You're waiting for the rest of the first time. I wait for uh, someone to make a movie theater where you go in, you get into your seat, like a rumble seat type thing. It's a whole, like, it's like a gaming chair, and mm -hmm. you got the VRs on, and it's like you're in the mm -hmm. damn movie. And it's everything's moving, and you're moving mm -hmm. around with it. They've tried doing stuff like that in Japan, I think. Of course they did. Japan always thinks of this shit like 10 years before everybody else. Um, they afford it, so, you know. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, like I said uh, off before we went live, I, when I was watching this, I'm, I was really confused. I was like, it, are they calling this a horror movie because the guy in it made a horror movie? Or is it because this is happening through the missile crisis, the Cuban missile crisis? But it was just like a side story. It wasn't even a major story. The, the creating of this movie and this uh, experience with John Goodman was the main story. So I'm like, where's the horror part? But I would the say movie was still good. I liked it. It was like a to me, it was like a uh, a family movie. Mm -hmm. Like you could sit down with your family and watch it. Like it's like it, it, it's like you said, it's nostalgic. It brings you back. You're like, oh, I remember like movie theaters being somewhat like not like fifties, but mm -hmm. some stuff is familiar. Like you go into how mm -hmm. movie theaters were and shit. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. Or it reminds you of other movies that you've seen, older theaters and stuff. And the creature features that would be so cool. You go outside of the theater and they have giant ant legs connected to the theater and at the head. Oh, like uh, that'll be so cool looking. I'll be taking pictures. Like every time like, I go, like we gotta go to the theater. I gotta take a picture out front. And go, going back to it though, James, like from this movie and from other fun horror movies that we've watched where they take place in a theater where they're doing all these fun little themes like this, that is what would drive people to go to the theaters more. Because you're getting that fun experience. That's mm -hmm. where you're getting those people that like to be loud in theaters. It's like now I can be loud with these people. You know what I mean? Because not it's not frowned upon here. Because once there's a jump scare, there's gonna be a real jump scare. Once there's a big laugh, there's gonna be a big laugh. Once there's yeah. this, there's gonna be this. And I feel, why the fuck not? Why is not? <laughs> well, like I just say jump in real quick, because uh, I don't want to forget, James. You are not alone with wondering why this is a horror movie. Um, so when it came out in 1993. Uh, it bombed. It bombed massively, partially because audiences weren't ready for a film like that, even though the following year Ed Wood came out and it became a huge thing. It was just a little too early for this kind of weird, nostalgic meta film. So Dante, uh, best known for Piranha, uh, The Howling, uh, Inner Space, but especially The Gremlins, short-lived franchise was not really a horror director uh per se but okay true they didn't know they even though it is literally basically like 
let's take Stand By Me, but also mix it in with this amazing love letter to cinema at that time period. I mean, so yeah, it, it's not a horror movie. The only horror that's really in the film is the paranoia that mm-hmm. comes from, you know, the uh, they're living in Florida in the Keys. So they're only 90 miles away from Cuba in the midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's actually less paranoia in the film than you would expect because yeah, that's what threw me off. The beautiful <laughs> job of uh, portraying teenagers and that their life is their life. They're just out. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're yeah, we're yeah. invincible. You've got the one there that's you know really outspoken, but everyone else is like, oh, I day her. Oh yeah, there might be a new yeah. girl. Oh, she's cute. Uh, it, it did a beautiful job of showing that you know insular way that teenagers can look at society but you got to remember that this was the closest we had ever come to nuclear war after years and years of red scare uh and then after we dropped the bomb we basically said okay other people can drop the bomb And there was a lot of fear. There's a reason why in the 1950s you have all these big insect movies uh, like Mantis and Them, which is about ants. Um, So there, boom, you have that, which is a paranoia. But at the same time, you also have McCarthyism in the Blacklist. And it's even said in the film at one point about how, you know, he was able to get so-and-so to do whatever Oh, that person's been blacklisted, which meant at the time, if you were brought up in front of McCarthy and his team of wonderful idiots, um, Mm -hmm. and somebody said you were a commie, you were a commie until you gave up other people. So this is a time when it was really hard to be an artist um, in the United States. Um you know, one of the biggest, like, okay, I'll throw my friends in front of the bus actors was Ronald Reagan. Um, So there you have that, which is a constant fear because, you know, all somebody would have to say is your material is is leftist in leaning. Uh, So you have that going on. Um, and you know th- that's where the horror kind of lies um you also have there's a reference to how the pta you know wants to ban the film yet again everybody was you know very easily it's when you mix in the cuban missile crisis and then you have these two guys that are you know standing in front of the theater and yelling about you know how this is horrible and it's work of the devil which those particular actors are very, very important in the film, but it just, that's the paranoia. That's as close to horror as it gets. It is, you know, I don't know, like um, Stand By Me meets Ed Wood. Okay. In its own way. That makes sense. But no, it, one of the things that made it bomb and pretty much kill uh, John Land or no, about no, me, Joe Dante. Uh, they get mixed up pretty much. Uh, Joe Dante's career was that it. They didn't know what to market it to, but it got some of the best ratings that year of any film. Really, I mean, it was wow. you know, uh, it, it just was. It was amazingly critically acclaimed, but they didn't know what they had. The meta mm. film didn't really exist, and it was, I think, pre the player. So, mm. wow. Oh, Doctor Sleep. That's cool. I never seen this one yet. Was it Doctor Sleep? I see yeah. that one. Yep, I haven't watched it yet. I read the book. Well, I did the audio book. I put it off because I am such a huge fan of Kubrick's Shining. So. so well, for uh, you're free next Thursday. I like the shine. I like the shining, also. Um, 
and I audio booked Doctor Sleep. Same. The, mm. and the book is always better. Mm. Oh, of course. But the movie, I didn't think it was. King is very warty, but with him being very warty, comes a lot more content in those books. Exactly. So, um, yeah. so Doctor Sleep was uh, the movie. It wasn't bad. I can say that it wasn't bad. It explained a lot of things, like like from mm -hmm. the book and everything. Like, like from the first movie, I didn't know what The Shining was. I thought they were just in a haunted hotel and, and the father got possessed. I didn't know it was, like, mm -hmm. it was about the dude because uh, the, <laughs> the kid had a special power and shit. Yeah. No, other shit. Yeah. So you know, I was like, what "The fuck?" What? But anyways, we'll talk about that next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like I said, I've never seen the movie, so I'm excited for that. Well, I mean, looking at matinee is a say if we remove the moniker of horror. Did you guys enjoy the movie? Oh, yeah, I was, enjoyed it. Yeah, I said yeah. that to Aaron. I messaged him. I was like, "Hey," because I thought I was watching the wrong movie. Mm -hmm. Because I looked up matinee. There's a movie called The Matinee. It's a slasher film. It came out 2020. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I was watching this. I was like, this, this this is not a horror movie. So I was like, yo, Aaron, you sure this? I was like, am I watching the right movie? And he sent me a picture. I was like, oh, okay, because I was like, this is not horror. I was like, I because I told him the other one. I was like, it came out 2020. It's a slasher. He's like, no, that's the right one because it's the CFF movie. I was like, okay. So I watched it, but I was like, then I wrote to him. I was like, it's a good movie. Mm. I was just expecting horror, but no, it was like. Good acting. I like the story. It's like kid has moved to town, like no friends, mm. makes friends and shit. It's like a little little mini stories through a thing. He makes friends with the guy who's making the um, the film and doing the fucking Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, like it was it. like mm -hmm. you yeah, know, I like I'll just you said about little things, and I want to point something out. It's very important in the beginning of the film. Um <coughs> excuse me. When Gene is sitting at the um, the uh, recess playground, he's got a famous Monsters of Filmland in his hand. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, a magazine that started printing in 1958. Uh, 4E.J. Ackerman was the, the editor. And this magazine at that time literally took the place of every horror fan today connecting the uh any chat room any group or whatever one magazine was your bible if you were that kid that loved oh. monsters it was also where you heard about old monster movies and cool. then it got you wanting to actually try to find these films because at the time if it's not in a theater you're shit out of luck um so that's very very important that's a little thing, but um, Gene is a monster kid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was that generation of monster kids that Joe Dante was. It, there, there's, especially in this film, a very autobiographical quality. So at that time, Dante would have been that about that old, 1962. And that kid reading Famous Monsters of Filmland having to get to the the next crazy movie the one that sits there and somebody asks him some simple question about a monster movie and he starts going off J uh, joe dante was one of those many kids your your whole like you know bulk of 80s directors that was their kid though that that they, that was them when they were kids and that's what mm. kept them together they communicate for famous monsters of film land mm. and you know another thing is in the theater every uh, on the marquee and every one of those posters are films that came out in the year of 1962. oh nice yes yeah. so it, it's um when you look at the movie that way it even spreads the horror thing thinner because it really has this wonderful i uh, i can't speak autobiographical quality uh when you just look at joe dante okay yeah yeah. Now you said you see this in theaters, Trevor. Yeah, I did see it in theaters, and it was a great. Um, you know, it, it it's very sad in a couple ways. Now Dante has 
remained very active uh and he is starting to do work again but i don't know how official this is but it did come up on a reputable news site uh actually mick and i were joking today about you know what if joe dante would get together with roger corman before he died because roger corman discovered joe dante and he and who's ever left of the Roger Corman training camp, um, like Martin Scorsese, um, would do a film. Joe Dante has officially been attached to a remake of Little Shop of Horrors. Now, I hope this actually happens. It happens before Corman passes away. And Corman's like, God, he's like 90 something, like 95 or something. But he's. Mm. He's, he's nonstop. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's funny. We talked about that today, and it wow. looks like that might happen. That'd nice. be crazy. And take yeah. it back to the original Little Shop of Horrors, which is a straight-up horror film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not I remember the, that. That was great, but that was our image of it in that time period. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. I haven't seen that. The movie. first one had Jack Nicholson, you know, having his little uh, Audrey, you know, to eat people, you know, <laughs> and legitimately eat them. You know. Oh, man. I got to watch that again. It's been years. Mm. Child. Child. Feed me, Seymour. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. I wanted to uh, dive into ratings before we forget. Oh, yeah. Um... Let's see, let's see, let's see. James, we'll this one. I enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it better now that a lot of it was explained. I'm going to give this one a seven. Cool. That's fair. How about you, Trevor? Ooh. 8.5. Ooh. Because I do enjoy the movie eat more each time I watch it. Because there's a lot of little stuff going on. Yeah, there is. Mm-hmm. I did enjoy the movie. I had a good time. A little less of a good time than you, James. I gave it a 6.5. Mm-hmm. Uh, not not a bad movie at all. I think it was more... Like, I know... I. Again, explained. I did enjoy it more, and with the horror elements, I did enjoy it. But if it had, I think if it had more of a turn towards horror, I would enjoy it a lot more. Mm-hmm. Or the element towards horror, but I love the concept, and I love the freaking the theater was like my favorite part of this damn movie. I'm mm-hmm. just like that in real life would be so damn fun. Of course. What they were not what happened, but what they were going for, <laughs> what they were going for was such a cool, fun idea. Especially the the mindset, like yo, we're gonna put this little miniature earthquake machine up in this place and have this whole building shake, <laughs> which was just crazy. Where, 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 where if you turn it up too high, it's gonna crumble the building. The whole top floor uh, floor caves in. Yeah, like what the well, hell? Right. We, we, we don't we don't we don't need the earthquake machine, but just everything yeah. else that happened, like. For example, the part where the lady is looking back and she's like behind you, she screams, and the dude with the hand suit pops up and he starts running around and shit. Stuff like that would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> of course, if it fits the theme, but this, oh my gosh. Yeah, put that one dude in a panic. That fucking guy is a, he was the most paranoid fucking person in the world. The owner of the theater mm-hmm. oh, with gosh. the radio in his pocket and shit. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Well, uh, another thing, you know, as far as, you know, really appreciating, you know, that this movie is actually telling, you know, pretty much a a real story. You know, of course, some of it is, you know, over the top, but between, sorry, 1959 and 1962, these are some of the movies that actually were released. Manster, The Killer Shrews, The Lost Woman. The giant leeches and the alligator people, and the list goes on. I want to watch. Now, by '62, you started seeing things like the pit and the pendulum and premature burial and that whole oh gothic thing, kind of take over. Um, 
But no, so Woesley is like William Castle toward the end of his career where he's just trying every conceivable new concept to just keep his his livelihood going, which then eventually William Castle went on to just direct films and things of that nature. But uh, he was. Uh, William Castle had a big old cigar. Uh, Samuel J. Arkoff also had a big old cigar. And, you know, the opening of the film in which, you know, Woesley is seated there and talking about, I have a new film. It's called Mant. The, it is almost line for line taken by the introductions for most of William Castle's films, Tingler, Homicidal, Dr. Sardonicus, um, uh, 13 Ghosts, uh, which was eventually remade and I think remade again. Uh, but no, that, that, he's the main guy that Woesley is supposed to be as far as a character in real life. Okay. Nice. Nice. Is this something you guys will watch again? This movie here? I mean, if it feels I don't watch it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was good. But like you said, I like I say every time, and you know me, I go for new stuff. I, I hardly go back and rewatch stuff. See, I'm more towards the middle with that now, James. Like, there's certain shit that I'm always going to go back and watch. I'm never going to not do that. I'm never going to apologize for doing that. But then there's ones where I'm just like, you know what? I really don't need to see this again. Yeah, I'm good. I'm, I've seen it enough. Or, you know, I'm, I'm good on it. But then there's just those ones where it's just like, nah. There's, I gotta just, watch so many, there's just so many movies out there I haven't seen. It's oh, like, I know. Why, why wouldn't I choose something new? You know, like, I'm not mm. going to. Why would I watch Friday the 13th again? After right. a thousandth time. But don't get me wrong. When I was younger, I watched this shit. I watched it a million times. Don't get me wrong. Mm. I think that's what it is. I think I just re watched uh, repeats of so many movies when I was younger. You know what it is? You know what it is? No, but I missed out a lot of just, movies. Just to shoot Friday the 13th, some bail is, at the very least, if you're a fan of it, and you're like, you know what? I'm, I'm only going to watch it on Friday the 13th. I'm going to watch as many mm -hmm. as I can every Friday the 13th, or at least that weekend. I accept that. That's fair. That's Jason fair. Voorhees. You're like, Jason Voorhees is my main man. Main horror icon. Always uh, has been. So... Would it be a controversial statement for me to say that my favorite is Jason Goes to Hell? Wait, no, what? Uh, I that, think that is my favorite wait. of the Jason films, Jason Goes to Hell. A lot of people I, hate that one. I, 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 I adore guess it. it's, the, it, it's the most creative of the entire franchise. Everybody hated that. A lot of people hate that one. I didn't mind it, but the mm -hmm. hate that movie got, I... I've oh, it's definitely my out. least favorite. I'm not gonna lie to you, but I, I, I do get it. I do get it. Like I've heard other. No, you're right. It was creative, the storyline. But you're you. But th that's the thing. People are listening to the storyline. Wait, what the hell are you doing to Jason? Mm -hmm. For that's one, how did a full body just rip out of a body with clothes and everything? Yeah. <laughs> it didn't feel like a Jason <laughs> movie. I guess you would say it didn't feel like a Friday the Thirteenth or a Jason know, movie. It was, it was, oh, yeah, it was weird. It took a very interesting way of trying to. I mean, it was pretty much assumed at a certain point that uh, Jason takes Manhattan that there's something supernatural. Maybe we just know this by now. But there was a need to try to explain it even further because they knew that, you know, because I think it was New Line that owned the rights to both uh, the Freddy films and the Jason films. They knew there was going to be mm -hmm. a team at some point. And I think that was the idea, but yet again, I think the script and everything just got out of hand. Um, I love the movie because it is so weird. It offers me everything other Jason films don't. It makes sense. Um, you are the king of Although I have to say the weird. worst is Jason Takes Manhattan because that was the biggest oh, yeah. opportunity. I agree, 75 totally. minutes of him just tearing people apart in Manhattan and Manhattan's reaction to him would have been amazing. Yep. I agree. Get rid of the boat and the teenagers and deliver that movie that we all saw the poster and went, yeah. 100%. 100%. Agreed a million so, percent. I was, so I was so disappointed in that one. That is the worst mm -hmm. one to me. 
Um, then at the end of the movie, have him arm wrestle Mick Manhattan just just to do it for us. <laughs> just for that's us. the only way he become king of Manhattan. <laughs> yep, that's how he takes Manhattan because he beats him in arm wrestling. <laughs> Mick is the final boss. <laughs> or cuts his hand off with a machete because uh, he gets pissed off. Either way, that's what we'll, we'll take. You mentioned before about rewatchability. I would mm-hmm. say this is either my fifth or sixth time. Sure. For this movie? For this film, yeah. Okay. Um, it's one of my, I'd have to say it's one of my favorite Joe Dante films all around. But like you That's said, true. this one is nostalgia. Like, mm-hmm. you can watch it over and over again there because the little things in it you mm-hmm. find. I'd much rather watch this over and over again than watch Piranha or oh, 100%. Over yeah. and over again. Okay. Um, which, you I know, can his, like, see that. I, 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 I could see that because with Piranha, I love it. It was fun and all that stuff. But it's like how you can only watch that so many times. I'm not saying you can't watch it again and again, but you, it's mm-hmm. like, okay, I watched it today. I'm not going to watch it again for a few years. With this movie here, I can see myself watching it once a year for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. If you know what I mean? Like, I could see at least once a year, once every whatever. But yeah, this definitely has more of a rewatchability. I could see that. I could definitely. It's see also, that. you know, I hate to say it, but it's a really cute movie. I mean, oh, yeah. Uh, at the time, there was a lot going on. So, you know, it was, you know, maybe around seven, eight years before the Stand By Me came out. So, you know, like these, you know, children coming of age films. Mm. But this is, this was the children coming of age films for us monster kids. Mm-hmm. You know, us kids that, you know, just kept to ourselves and we talked about our movies and all that kind of stuff. And then we, you know, all flocked to the theater you know, of course, it's being a different time period. Um, but it was the movie where that ended up being the cool things. You know, us geeks that are into movies got the girls. Mm-hmm. We're the mm-hmm. heroes. Um, I love that about the film. Because, of course, Starkweather, who uh, is, is a nice little jab to um, Charlie Starkweather, uh, who was a spree killer at the time, uh, to be the villain. Um you know it yeah the 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 nerds took out the bully even mm. though he's an idiot hmm. yeah john john good uh goes with characters is like he's like uh total con artist too in this thing mm-hmm. like like it. because his machine broke that they're, they're like you you destroyed my bill he's like no the kid he did it he pointed at the kid who was getting arrested already. He was like, he did it. What are you talking yeah, about? He me? Really messed up everything, which, I mean, he, yeah. he did mess up a lot of Actually, shit. Actually, he did. Yeah. He caused all that because had he, had he not chased the kid and attacked him and all that other bullshit didn't happen. I had, I had like a, I had like a dumb moment too because I was like, I don't know why. I don't know why I thought like the 50s were like dinosaur years or something. But at the end, where, uh, when he blamed the kid, and then the, and the owner started flipping in the uh that really old guy uh was a specter oh no, mr specter mr specter mm-hmm. was walking in with them and he goes that's what uh you got insurance i was like they didn't have insurance in 50 i was like i was like wait a minute yeah, they oh, did. Yeah. i was like what the fuck is wrong with me i was like they're not that old <laughs> 62 so yeah definitely. yeah i was like they're not that old there was insurance yeah. back then what the fuck is wrong mm-hmm. with me just it's, it's you know it's just one of those things you kind of see the style of it and you think it's older than what it really is because we in the back of our minds i feel like we still have that little kid brain where it's like yo 1950 is so old or it's like you're saying a certain age is so old but then you're like yo fuck man i'm like right around the corner at a certain age it's, it's not that old yeah, we used to talk a lot of shit when yeah. we were kids. In yeah, the I caught myself. I was like, I was, a, I felt so dumb when it, <laughs> when I finished the sentence in my head. Like I was talking to myself in my head. I was like, um, what the fuck is wrong with me? Oh, that's fucking funny. That's <laughs> fucking funny. The, the other thing that you know, I think people didn't really get when it first came out, and you know, nowadays with directors like Wes Anderson. And just, you know, how, you know, even look at Fallout, how Fallout is. It has a very, you know, kind of almost plastic quality to it. This film, you know, presents 1962 in total prestige. Like, there, there, there's, you know, not dirt on the road. There's, you know, 
um, it is supposed to kind of look a little off and a little fantasy esque. And I think at that time it kind of confused some people too. And yet again, goes back to it, James. A lot of people, you know, went in with the idea like, oh, it's Joe Dante. Oh, it's a horror movie. But you think when you put John Goodman on on your your movie poster, people would go, well, "This is a comedy." But they there's don't. a little comedy in it. They had it. They made him <laughs> poke at uh, his uh, Fallout shelter. He's like, "Where'd you get this?" He's like, "Oh, I bought it off bought it out of what the magazine or something." Mm-hmm. So, he, so that's why it's easily they took it apart. <laughs> like it was nothing. Yeah, like yeah, like you dumbass. You ordered this shit. It's oh like, the, like, these, like, like today, don't robot. order the shit over oh. a line. Like, where'd you order this? Amazon? You dumbass. Now, at that time, it probably would have still been Sears and a Roebuck. Yeah. <laughs> the uh-huh. Amazon since the 1920s. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. This, this here, though, I mean, again, you kind of horror ish. I think it'd be a good introduction for kids for horror, for ones that aren't into it at all, just because. The little elements it does have in there, it's not over the top at all. It's real silly. It's like a fun, funny way. And it's not a lot. It's not like in your face all the time a lot. So it'd be kind of a little more than subtle, I guess you would it say. It showed a lot of scenes of the Mant movie. Mm-hmm. There was like zoom up of the I thought that uh the Ant Man dude looked pretty cool. I did too. Oh, that that was very well made. Yeah. I, I love the explanation of Somehow, an ant's saliva gets into his bloodstream. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just. I it happened. Is, it you know, must have happened. It had, bad movie only way it happened. Me. It happened at exact the same time. This happened. <laughs> Excuse me. You're like what? What? How he, the doctor was explaining it? It was like mm-hmm. the ant. He must have something happened at, at this exact time when this happened. He got. Oh, and, yeah. That, just, that's yeah. how this. That's how he mutated. I'm like okay. Try to make scientists. You try to make it turn into like some scientific, like like incredible real. hawk shit, like gamma rays type thing. Turn into a damn ant. But no, you gotta do that in those movies, though. Like, how did this happen? An ant just bit him. There's something wrong with the ant. Yeah, it's a radioactive fucking ant, like Spider Man. You know, <laughs> the time the movies basically had to do with something. You know, it was in the 1950s when you had the the monster and creature features. It was usually either atomic, it was mm-hmm. something that was somewhat damning to science because science did this, um, or it was a Red Scare film uh, based on the xenophobia of people from outer space. Yep. Yeah, those three Outer things. space monsters, yep. yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, you know, th- those were were massive, and those were big, and a lot of them were made about as well as the Mant movie. Yeah. I have a, a a very large part of my heart for, you know, I you know, I remember on network television, especially on Sundays, where I first got my taste of Godzilla, was also where I first got my taste of the fly. Yeah, um, the fly. Them, yep. um, all these movies, um, you know, uh that I don't know if they have a great rewatchability as I get older. But yeah. I still feel very, you know, nostalgic about them. Mm-hmm. I think kids are, we used to be like, you know, the you spoon fed us initially with Godzilla and big monsters from the 50s and 60s or alien invasions. And now I think people just kind of jump in <laughs> with mm-hmm. like, well, this is a horror film. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this was a this was definitely this was definitely a fun this was definitely a fun watch. Wow, get your words oh, yeah. out there. Definitely a fun watch, and again, it's it's at the very least worth a one time watch. I think it's worth more than one. I just don't know when I would get to it again because, like you were saying, James, for the most part, I do try to watch newer movie newer. I won't say newer movie newer to me. Because it could be a newer yeah. movie to me that came out in 1987 that I've yeah, never seen. Yeah, that's what I mean. Seen. Yeah, something I've never seen before. That's what I mean. So yeah. newer to me. Let me let me rephrase that when I say that. Newer to sturdy. If I've never seen it, it's newer to me. <laughs> I don't care when it came out. But um that's the way I view it. Yeah. 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 How did you not see that? It didn't come across my radar. 
I find more mm -hmm. joy now uh, going deeper down roads of different countries and different mm -hmm. genres and finding something that really generally, you know, appeals to me and, you know, makes my, you know, my ears prick up and versus what's coming out now in horror yeah. and science mm -hmm. fiction. Um, mm -hmm. There's good stuff. It's I just it. like everything else, you know, of course, the, the major studios, <sighs> diarrhea, mm -hmm. but, the mm -hmm. time. but um, you know, even now it's harder to find the indie stuff because there's so much stuff like, you know, pressed in our faces and how many different streaming programs. So oh, yeah, it's true. So it's true. freaking many, so yeah. freaking many. You're right about that. You're right. Oh my God. How many oh, shark man. movies do you have to get to before you get to something else? Mm. Or a good one. Yeah. They're doing so one with a three-headed shark that's coming out sometime this year. It looks oh. adequately pa pathetic. Yeah. Nice. Some of those are fun as hell. Don't get me wrong. Within their summer, it's just like, this isn't fun. It's just bad. I think yeah, you had a three-headed one. I think it was like three-headed shark attack or something. It was yeah. Oh, there's plenty. Yeah. There's plenty. Mm. So dumb. <laughs> oh man, I can't wait to watch another shitty shark movie. That'll be coming up at some point. People, don't worry. I'd rather watch those than Sharknado, though. For some reason, I have a hate for Sharknado. Same here. I don't know Same. why. I just cannot. Is it Tara Reed? No, because I did. I like the movie we just reviewed with Tara Reed in it. What movie was that? The fucking um. The oh, Charlie's movie. Farm. Charlie's Farm. I thought that That's movie right. was awesome. That's right. I thought it was terrible. I, I just think it's stupid. A tornado that has a whole bunch of sharks in it. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> I don't know. But one of the, the many, uh, you know, at the time, if it for me, if it was made by Sci-Fi, the television station, it was it was made for no money at all. And their it, productions look that way. And that was my it, biggest thing about Sharknado. It looked painfully cheap. And, yeah. Painfully cheap. And somehow the CGI is like overdone. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't good. It's just like, they just cranked up the dial. They're like, yo, we're going to make this shirt look like ridiculously CGI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where everybody could tell a fucking newborn baby can tell this is CGI. Oh, this is bad. <laughs> start crying. When the baby sees it, start crying. Cause that shit's time. Just the Sharknado, like the tornado with the sharks made no sense. The Clownado made more sense than the Sharknado. You ever watched Clownado? I'm not sure. I think so. Yeah. It wasn't good. No, it's you like, know, it's, I like a, it's like a tornado of supernatural clowns. It's mm -hmm. like a, it's like a supernatural tornado of clowns. Yep. Oh, you're talking about an insane clown posse show. Yeah, that's who maybe. <laughs> so it's the movie about really fucked up juggalos. Wait, that's <laughs> Yeah, it was Clown Nato. I was like, what the fuck is this? I watched that before and I was like, all right. But well, Shark Nato, some reason I hate it. I don't know. I'm with you. And there's I'm like ten of there's like nine of them now, Shark Nato in space. There can't be a tornado in space. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> That's the only one I want to see is if there's one that goes to space. Cause I had you know what I'm not gonna say it on the live. Matter of fact, we're gonna wrap this one up. Listen, people. Yeah. You gotta go check out our amazing guest Trevor and Ambassador Radio. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. This guy knows his shit. Not just movies, but music and a bunch of other knowledge. Shows. Everything. He calls it useless knowledge. I call it very important knowledge. Because someone's going to want to know about it. Yeah. Someone's going to want to know about it. And then, of course, you can check myself and James out. Co-hosts over on Popcorn and Pines every Saturday at 9 o'clock. We are back this weekend doing a Highlander and Short Circuit. Um... Someone on here really loves one of those movies and really hates the other. You'll find out which and who. I'm not going to give you any spoilers. And, of course, be on the lookout for Horror Source 30 every Thursday at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. And under the same umbrella, but Cerdo Vision every Friday at midnight. Technically Saturday at 12 a.m. This weekend we are doing Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw okay. Massacre, Part 3. That's a good one. And Shocker. So a double header. Yeah. GCM three. three is not given as much love as it should have been. And shocker. I only watched it one time very recently, so it'll be a fun rewatch because I don't really remember it. Mm -hmm. But tune in for that, people. We'll be watching that live tomorrow. 
are reviewing that live tomorrow, not watching that. Um, I'll see you in your nightmares. Peace. Peace.